Welcome everyone, I'm Brett Seidel, the AZ-Wing Drone Program Manager, or DOU. This is the programmatic update that was delivered at our recent 2023 Wing Conference in June. Start off with a little fun. This is from our February 2023 OPEX in Cave Buttes, which is in Northeast Phoenix. Uh, you're seeing our AFAM X2D drone in the foreground, and then the aerial direction photography and editing of this shot rolled up by Cadet Bunyan Reinke of Deer Valley, and then NHQ picked up this shot. So I'm interested to see uh, where that ends up. This is from our May 20th 5U training qualification for Glendale 388. Two of the wings Air 2S kits uh, in the foreground. This picture is also composed by Bunyan Reinke inside Cave Buttes. Again, from our 388 training, it's a great overhead view of this new section inside Cave Buttes we're experimenting with, right at the base of a 300 foot hill um, with cleared out section to the left and right of us. So plenty of room to stretch our legs out here. Drone integration has been spreading into all aspects of CAP. Let's take a look at IMT. The SUS team deployment guide for IMT staff is now live and in draft phase two. This is the AZ Wing specific version we're looking at that's linked to in Cactus. And then there's a separate non AZ Wing version uploaded to the Civil Air Patrol drone wiki. And so I pinged NHQ about that and I'm waiting on input um, for that copy. So the goal of this guide is you can see sections one through nine provide about two hours of background education for IMT on how best to apply and deploy drones. And then sections 10 through 12 are condensed quick reference material that is useful once IMT staff are up to speed. The AZ Wing guide can be found in Cactus under SUAS resources. Here's the other version under Topic Hubs on the Civil Air Patrol Drone Wiki. Let's run through a few examples of what's in that guide. So, Regulation State's primary oversight of drone teams falls to Air Operations Branch Directors or Ground Branch Directors on a case-by-case -case basis. And then if that staff position is unavailable, it falls to the Ops Section Chief or the Incident Commander to oversee teams. And then Unmanned Branch Directors are not a position um, nor an achievement in CAP. So oversight responsibility always falls to those aforementioned IMT staff positions. Some more information from the integration guide. So this is based on information from the Skybound Rescuer Project and DGI SAR Altitude Guide, which they make recommendations based on what target you're looking for and then assign recommended altitudes, speeds, gimbal orientations. So when searching for an adult laying down, the recommended altitude is 200 feet with daylight camera, 230 foot from thermal, uh, and then gimbal orientation of negative 90 degrees. You can see two example photography shots of that. And then based on those captures, the target's profile in pixels is given, which then feeds mathematically into your detection, recognition, and identification chart. And so this is a great baseline when starting to make decisions about how to conduct search missions. Here's an example of one of the quick reference calculation tables towards the end of this IMT and integration guide. And we're looking at Skydio 2, and then it, for a visual search of an adult laying down 145 acre area, we're searching at 200 foot. It's gonna take us 17 minutes with 50% overlap. Because we're doing this with uh, post-flight imagery analysis, we can fly at 34 miles an hour, which is the fastest a Skydio 2 will go. If you were scanning in real time, you'd have to slow that down to 12 miles an hour because you just can't see. Uh, otherwise, you're going too fast, right? And then separately, if your customer is asking for mapping with 1.5 inches per pixel, you can just check the chart uh, to see for 145 acre area it would take you 23 minutes at 300 foot AGL. And then just add a little buffer time in there for pre-flight and post-flight air crew duties. Continuing on to integration with logistics. So we've stood up some new databases in AZ Wing that are enhancing the situational awareness of drones and the supporting gear that drone teams need. Um, these databases are not in competition with ORMS, just like Cactus is not in competition with Wimmers. It's simply an extension and enhancement. 
right? And so links to these databases have been sent around to some of the wing staff stakeholders, and they will continue to be shared uh, to those that have a need and are seeking aircraft or gear. So right here, um, we're looking at the full list. It's a landing page, and it's all the aircraft in ORMS um, alphabetically. That's in position of AZ Wing right now. And then if you go to the right, you can see other data points like what squadron it's at, what the kit contains, the serial numbers, all the other numbers. You go far enough to the right and you see uh, when the FA registration is going to expire. And then also this uploaded copy of the registration PDF as well. Say yours gets damaged or lost. You can just come in here and print off another one. And then finally, what uh, command group it belongs to currently. Then you can go to this other view, the squadron view. So now here's easily at a glance what squadron has what kind of gear and drones. Right, if you go all the way to the right and click three more, it'll show you the rest of the squadrons. Then you can just click on the drone and give you all the detailed information about it. If you want to see what command group uh, has what, uh, see by north, east, south, and west, all that's been arranged for you. And then if you just want to see the gear, you can click here, or if you just want to see the aircraft, click there. And then relevant to uh, certain staff, and especially SUAS aircraft maintenance officers, this soonest expiring FA registration date. You can see we have some coming up in June, then July, and then August, and then not until December uh, do we have to start renewing some of our next ones. Let's go back to this full list here. So if you go over the squadron uh, data point, you can click on that. You can either go to the full squadron warehouse database or just to Glendale Composite where it's at. And so this part of the project is, is still kind of a work in progress. We're collecting all the information about the squadron, especially who's the point of contact that can help us um, get that drone out of there and possibly points of contact multiple where is the drone being stored inside the the squadron and then who are we going to be mailing new gear to right if we have more drone gear to send okay and let's see click out of that so then if we get back here we go to squadron warehouse database um, that's all of now the squadrons and that similar type of information collected uh, all the squadrons anyway they're participating in the drone program right now CAP 74-1 is our new maintenance standard for drones. AZ Wing has 24 drones in ORMS, and at those numbers, the regulation recommends we delegate aircraft maintenance officer duties to below wing when possible. And so this program needs an influx of drone AMOs, right? And we also need these uh, drone contract maintenance facilities, or CMFs. We have zero currently. And so I need to work with wing staff on the exact process for getting CMFs approved because otherwise you're having to send to national and they're, they're very busy up there. So you're looking inevitably at long timelines in order to get that turnaround for your drone sent back to you. Then you can see some of these maintenance targets do exist, right? For propellers, engines, avionics, and potentially these sudden major maintenance events as well. Now, the AMO responsibilities described in CAP 130-3 mirror the drone program's support needs. You can see, reading each one of those, they're all relevant. But let's say, uh, take for instance, coordination of repairs with CMFs and or NHQ. To have that support throughout each group would be a tremendous advantage for ensuring timely repairs are completed. And then these AMOs also have partial ownership of aircraft information files. And now all drones in ORMS all need unmanned information files or UIFs. And these UIFs are circulating around AZ Wing right now. They do have a published table of contents. We record flights in there. We have maintenance records in there, among other things. It's an SUI item now, so it's important we ensure updated copies exist in 100% of cases. Moving on to drone integration at Air Force bases. So Davis Monthan Squadron's Tim Mitchell, Lieutenant Colonel in CAP, and USAF has been leading this local effort to seek on-base parcels for drone flights. 
And now one has just been identified. It's right outside controlled airspace, but it's still within this red grid. It's highly restricted area. It's on base. Um, and so we have a submission package sent to National right now. We're hoping that they can help us make this happen. If it does go through, this may also open up an avenue to pursue counter UAS red cell operations with Davis Monthan. Now these are specialized coordinated attempts with base. And so CAP red cell teams attempt to penetrate the airspace and then Davis Monthan responds with, you know, whatever technology they're using. And so until that's approved, Davis Monthan still flies indoors at several on-base facilities as shown here. Let's take a look at some elements of training. If you're a squadron that's already involved or thinking of getting involved with drones, find your nearest AE officer and ask them to order more planes or drone stem kits. I mean, these have real value. The apprentice kit is worth 500 bucks. The Cetus Beta FPV kits worth around 150 bucks, and they build transferable skills, real skills that will serve you moving forward. These are a few of our satisfied customers. Um, recently qualified and going home with corporate drone kits to enrich their respective squadrons AE, CP, and ES programs. Once your squadron has one of these corporate kits, you can start to train with high quality photography, 4K video, mapping, live streams. Shown above is a mapping mission that was live streamed. And then below is the resulting photography process through our CAP Enterprise drone deploy accounts and turned into a 3D model. All of that was done by a CAP cadet. Cadets are being given the opportunity of a lifetime when given access and exposure to this kind of technology. And so this is just an example, one example of the gravity of what can be accomplished on the AE and CP side of things, this critical skill building that can later serve customers. Here's your CAP drone qualification chart. So looking at the left side first, the CAP if 70-5U or just commonly known as your 5U flight evaluation, this is your annual, right? And you're earning airframe endorsements and pilot endorsements through it. So your first opportunity to become pilot in command in CAP is to earn that rotary wing endorsement and a recreational pilot endorsement. Right, so then you're a pilot in command, certified for aerospace education and CP missions. Remember, it's always a two-man team though, so you'll still need a visual observer. Then if you're moving along on the pilot endorsement side, if you then pursue the FA-107 commercial license, which many in CAP already have, then the new CAP drone regulation um, opens up instructor and check pilot positions at the 5U level. Okay, so squadrons that have um, an upswell of 5U qualified members, these are being primed for success. And then if even one of those members goes on to pursue some further education, become a check pilot, then that squadron is moving swiftly towards a self-sustaining local drone program. Okay, and then squadrons gaining steam should also be pursuing the technician ES qual along the right side. It's relatively straightforward, squitter to complete, five exercises to full qualification, um, but you can still participate in actual missions even at the trainee level. Here's a map of squadrons color-coded by group that have active drone programs or qualified drone members. Aircrew figures chart to the left current as of May 2023. Quals with asterisks are trainee status and it's broken down by adult and cadet. The only thing not represented here is all of the pre-solo training that's happening locally, um, which does have a badge associated with it now. And we have near-term AE and ES training plans for seniors and cadets at Glendale, Scottsdale, Falcon, Willie, and Davis Monthan. Moving on to upcoming technology we're expecting in the medium term. I've been informed that CAP is buying up to 10 of these Blue List approved AFAM ready Wingtra VTOL aircraft per year if funding is available. Um, NHQ is already sending me a ton of information about them, which I post to the CAP drone wiki. And then for large area search or mapping in reasonable timeframes, you just can't beat fixed wing. 
So as many know, drone teams need to keep aircraft within visual line of sight or VLOS of all members of the team as a standard, right? And so that we have to operate within those boundaries unless we get a special waiver for extended visual line of sight or beyond visual line of sight, which NHQ um, can coordinate. So size and coloration matter when you're looking at VLOS, right? Skydio 2 is in blue. They have VLOS out to about 1,800 feet. So from a fixed point, teams can cover about 234 acres. More commonly, though, you're going to see flight planning software making flights as squares since they're much easier to plan. So the inscribed square of that is 145 acres. Skydio X2D now is visible out to 2,500 feet at 450 acres of coverage, and the winter is out to 3,800 feet, covering around 1,000 acres. We now have this nationwide partnership with Canadian company Unmanned Systems Research, and so this was their messaging on Facebook end of April, making it official. Um, Unmanned Systems Research makes several interesting softwares. The one CAP is focusing on right now is Locate. And so you program Locate to look for specific colors in your post-flight photography, and it quickly scans every picture at the pixel level, pixel by pixel, looking for whatever color you're programming. So some may recall the Archer project in CAP's history. It was this big belly-mounted camera array with specialized um, software. So think of this locate now as separating the software from that hardware. You can run locate on any field laptop and provide it uh, photography from a, a wide array of drones. And then so learning this is not restricted to drone teams. Anyone can learn it. Then if you have a field or base ES qualification, you can go and support drone teams during missions. All right, so the license application process for each wing is going to be announced by NHQ soon. So this is bad luck, Bill, and uh, Bill has died in the desert probably 10 times now. So I programmed an earlier version of Locate to search for blue pixels, and it scanned 300 photographs in two minutes and found him. You can see he's circled in that picture on the right. AZWing has one of the NHQ Skydio X2Ds outfitted with a software called 3D Scan. One of the things it can do is automate exceptionally close high res capture of infrastructure. And so the drone itself now is air gapped and DOD approved. So even the most sensitive targets are within our purview. And you're seeing this initial flight stage where the drone has been given a target and then flies around it, building an internal wireframe for future autonomous flight planning. Then it flies around capturing photography. As overlapping coverage of the target increases, coloration changes to purple. You can see that in this augmented reality overlay that they offer. Then you can review from your controller the edge view model to ensure proper coverage. You're looking for as much purple as you can get. You can see purple equates to 16 plus photos of the same location. If you can get you know, super high overlap, then your model is just gonna look fantastic. This is from our AE 3D model earlier. You can see this scallop shape in the dam makes interior resolution difficult to achieve, even though the overall 3D model looked good from the angle that we had seen it at. Now there's ways around this. You can plan vertical flights on either side of the dam and that will improve resolution. But the Skydio 3D scan software automates it and does an even better job because it's literally flying within feet of the entire structure and wrapping the inside of those scallops autonomously. So you get this photorealistic 3D model. And so this is us zoomed all the way in on that higher quality model. And you can see you can get very high detail. You can do legitimate uh, infrastructure inspection with the, these kind of results. Moving on to gear. So this program has been maturing over time, and then you can see this big jump in cash requests in 2023 because we're now in the process of outfitting squadrons and teams around the state in a standardized way. So that money is supporting wing-wide drone programs at all levels. Let's walk through a portion of what that's being spent on. We've got a whole bunch of Apache 4800 cases to forward fit and retrofit drone kits. These were custom cut in my garage. 
We have eight of these kits circulating in the wing right now. They support the AE and CP missions as well as corporate missions for customers. These drones were the fly more combos that come with extras of everything. And then we've then upgraded them with strobes for night compliance. You get two UAV vests with your kit. It comes with an SD card, rapid chargers, so you can charge four batteries in one hour instead of one in one hour. It's a soft case inside hard case design. So you can extract the soft case and carry it long distances if needed. Then you still have a, a few forward fit items pending purchase. You have this 100 watt power supply to rapid charge your accessories and then iPad mini sixes. Since the drone industry, they preferentially develop software for Apple. Right? And you need iPads to run drone deploy with the Air 2S kits and with our Skydio, existing Skydio 2 kits. Plus, you don't want to obligate members to use their own cell phone to fly. And even if they did, that cell phone's an unknown variable and may or may not be compatible. We have one of these completed power pack concepts in the wing and West Group, deployable at training events and missions. So drones are very power hungry. But this pack would keep you flying all day and night. And just picture one of these or something like it in each group. 22 of these custom AZ Wing SUAS STEM kits were approved just in time for indoor flying during the summer. These DJI Tellos are extremely flyable to the point you see in real time members beginning to think of themselves as, quote, someone who can fly a drone. They're boost combos with extras of everything. Um, and we've upgraded that further with replacement motors, advanced propeller guards, and a two-year warranty. So these can be used uh, during 5U evaluations. They're great for drone top flights if you're making that outreach to teachers and their students. Some of these will be co-located with our corporate drone kits. Some will be distributed to squadrons looking to spark local interest in drones. And just remember, drones at this level are exempt from the CAPR 70-4 regulation, so you have more latitude on how you can apply them. AZ Wing maintains vibrant partnerships with other organizations and wings. Hats off to Maricopa County Sheriff. Uh, they've been a fountain of drone knowledge and allow us to train inside the 4,000 acre cave Buttes parcel. George Wing and Mississippi Wing are where the NHQ drone program managers on the volunteer side uh, are and we talk constantly. Other wings along the bottom have contributed quite a bit to the drone wiki. And then we just struck up a relationship with Phoenix Police Drones and have agreed to collaborate on Locate. We also have a standing invite to visit their facilities and check out their drones. And then they came over to my squadron and just talked quite a bit. And they let me fly their Avada, which was awesome. And then Kasara, which is Canada's cap, I meet regularly with them alongside NHQ's SUAS stakeholders. And, and we just talk shop about drones. So that's an interesting um, upcoming partnership. Looks like Kassara is going to potentially be given access to e-services, potentially issued drones, especially if we're going to be working with them along some of those common borders when uh, SAR incidents do happen. Finally, you have AJIC, which AZ Wing's Deputy DOU Jonathan Golson actively volunteers through. John is giving a keynote speech about CAP, SUAS, and geospatial information at AJIC's upcoming geospatial summit at Yavapai Community College in Prescott. So kudos to John for securing and committing to that opportunity. That's it for the programmatic update. If you're looking to get started in drones, head over to the Civil Air Patrol drone wiki and go to the CAPIF 70-5U ground school. There's a full walkthrough that'll take you step by step through that qualification. Just above that, you can see introduction to drones. If you're at complete zero, go there first and then head to the 5U ground school. All right, you can get to the CAP drone wiki by going to Google and searching the full name Civil Air Patrol Drone Wiki, and it should be your first result. Other browsers like Yahoo, etc., don't always find it reliably um, as the, the first result.